Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Barbara. Thank you, Stephanie. It's nice to see you, too. So let's welcome everybody to this evening. Indeed. We shall. That would be excellent. I will do it. Um, it is a, a nasty evening, and I'm hearing that the rain is a little heavier, but maybe we will be surprised as more folks get here. But you are most welcome to this last chapter in our lecture week, our spring lecture week. Uh, my name is Barbara Moore, and I am part of the LBGT Community Advisory Group, a group of Christian churches here in our community that plans these lectures as part of Colgate's Lecture Week. I want to highlight the churches um, that folks are members of the committee. Stephen Price is here from Christian Community Church. Uh, Daryl Lance is here, who is on the committee. Um, Bray Adams from uh, Open Arms Metropolitan Community Church and several others on the committee could not be here this evening. Melanie May, Do Good May, uh, Lake Avenue Baptist Church. In the past. <laughs> so the Chai Lai Community Church, the Divinity School, Covenant United Methodist, Downtown Presbyterian, Emmanuel Baptist, Lake Avenue Baptist, Open Arms, Metropolitan Community Church, Third Presbyterian Church, and the Gay Alliance come together to plan these lectures. Uh, Christian Faith and the LBGT Experience. This a uh, program of bringing to our community national and local speakers has been in existence for close at least 20 years. And uh, speaking for the Divinity School, we feel honored to be part of this planning group. So I'd like to invite Bray Adams. Ah, uh, here comes one of our treasures. I'd like to invite Bray Adams, who will introduce our speaker. Good evening. I would like to introduce um, my good friend, uh, Maurice Tomlinson. Maurice is a Jamaican attorney and senior policy analyst with the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network. At the Legal Network, Maurice acts as counsel and or claimant in cases challenging anti-gay laws before the most senior tribunals in the Caribbean. He authors reports to regional and UN agencies on the human rights situation for LGBTI people in this region. He conducts judicial and police LGBTI and HIV sensitization training and facilitates human rights documentation and advocacy, capacity building exercises. Previously, Maurice was a lecturer of law at the University of Technology in Jamaica, uh, and he is also at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. He's also worked as a corporate lawyer. Y'all don't mess with him, he knows the law. <laughs> In 2012, Maurice received the inaugural David Cato Vision and Voice Award, which recognizes individuals who defend human rights and the dignity of LGBTI people around the world. Maurice and his husband, Captain Reverend Tom Decker, lived in Rochester for two years where they were my predecessors at Open Arms Metropolitan Community Church and they served uh, in that capacity for two years, marking the move from the suburbs into the city and changing forever the way that Open Arms would be as a part of the community. So it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend, Maurice Tomlinson. So, thank you for coming out on this typical Rochester evening. <laughs> It'll be sunny by the time we leave. Um, 
And uh, as Bray said, Tom and I lived here for two years, and I've attended one of these lectures, and I found them incredibly helpful, insightful, entertaining. And so it was a shock when I was asked to deliver this year's lecture, and I'm really honored. So thank you to all the sponsors and all the persons who have put this on and have invited me to deliver this talk, which I hope will not disappoint. Um, now, I'm a lawyer, so don't hold it against me. Um, I have provided you with your briefing documents, <laughs> as I am wont to do, but I won't speak to them. I will touch on them and I will um, highlight important issues, but this is for you if you want to, you know, mull over some of the things I've said, and also if you wish to contact me to see clarification, my card is in here, All right? So we're done, let's go eat. Um, <laughs> when I start these talks, I like to use the Jamaican flag as an illustration, not just for decoration. The colors of the Jamaican flag are black, green, and gold. The black stands for hardship. The green is the land, and the gold is the sunshine. So please note that what I'm engaging in is not Jamaica bashing. It's Jamaica realizing. It's realizing that there is some black, but there is some green and some gold. It's also realizing that Jamaica has a very proud history of human rights activism. We were the first country to impose sanctions on apartheid South Africa. We were the first country to sign the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. However, on the issue of LGBT rights, we have not such a great history. And so the question is why? And we're going to talk about that today. Um, what I also want to point out is that Jamaica is not the worst country in the world when it comes to LGBT persecution. In fact, there are 75 countries that criminalize same gender intimacy for one form or the other. Seven of them with the death penalty. Um, of the 75, the bulk are in the former British Commonwealth. And sadly, Jamaica doesn't have the worst law in the Commonwealth Caribbean. Barbados has life imprisonment. Belize and Trinidad ban the entry of homosexuals. And in Trinidad, it's 25 years for any form of same gender intimacy, even holding hands in the privacy of your bedroom. But there is a distinction between how the law is on the books and how it is practiced. And in Jamaica, although the sentence is only 10 years in prison at hard labor, we recently increased the penalty by requiring that once you're released from prison, you must now register as a sex offender. You must now carry a pass. And if you do not have this pass, you must pay a $1 million Jamaican fine, about 10,000 US, plus spend 12 months in prison for each offense of not having your pass. And this amendment was made in 2011. Okay? So a um, rather innocuous law on the continuum in the Caribbean. I mean, we're only 10 years. Remember, Barbados is life. Guyana is 25 years. We're in the middle. We made it worse in 2011. Why is that? And why did I label or title my lecture when faith kills. Well, the sad reality is, as a person of faith, I have had to contend with the fact that my brothers and sisters in faith are responsible, to a large extent, for what's happening. Um, and as I was sharing with, with Bray today, I'm doing some reading <laughs> on how I can reconcile with them. The chief homophobe in Jamaica who is also a very religious man, was a Pentecostal. He's my son's godfather. It's very painful. Um, I'm reading Living Reconciliation, Behold I Make All Things New, which is about how the Anglican communion is wrestling with the issue, and The Moral Minority from the Canadian perspective. Just so some of the books I think you might find helpful. Um, now, I had prepared a lovely PowerPoint, and there was some miscommunication, my, my fault exactly, uh, <laughs> entirely. But, I'm, I'll try and deliver this without it, and I, I think, as a lawyer, I should be able to paint good pictures without, um, otherwise I'll fail, <laughs> without images. So, why is that? Um, well, 
The situation in Jamaica up to the late 70s, early 80s was really a live and let live, let it all hang out, no problem man, smoke a joint and be fine kind of thing. <laughs> you know, Negril was the thing, okay? Um, then in the late 70s and early 80s, something started to change in Jamaica. My mother herself, a very you know, ardent pillar of the church, noticed it. She called it a coarsening of Jamaican society. And that was when we started to see a lot of the American televangelists, first televangelists, um, coming. And for us, telev televangelism was a big thing because we just started getting color televisions in, 19, in the late 70s, early 80s. And we started to get, um, you know, these broadcasts of stuff that by then you had started to discredit and disown and basically ignore, but it came into our homes in this new format and it was so powerful and it was just about the time of the HIV AIDS epidemic hitting and pastors <clears throat> Jimmy Swaggart et al were saying well the reason the gays are getting AIDS is because it's a sin and so you have a combination of a powerful new medium with a powerful epidemic and a very attractive message. Because at the time, as now in Jamaica, you could not preach against promiscuity because 85% of our population is born out of wedlock. You could not, and the average age of sexual debut in Jamaica is nine, okay? You could not preach against alcoholism because there's literally a rum bar in front of every church. <laughs> but you could preach against homosexuality because gays meant AIDS. And it was a very powerful message, powerfully packaged, and it was very attractive, and it brought in congregants. And even though at the time we knew that there were many members of our congregation or choir or deacons were gay, was a don't ask, don't tell, they were slowly being squeezed out or forced into the closet because it was just not a popular time to be gay. And so, even though there had been a nascent LGBT movement in Jamaica up to that time, it was driven underground. And one of the leaders, Larry Chang, had to eventually flee to the United States to seek asylum. Because we were very close to where your LGBT liberation movement was at that point. But in a small island, he had no protection. Whereas in the States, he could you know, flee to San Francisco. And you know, there, was a game, there was no such bulk or you know, body to protect him. So he had to flee to the States. And a Canadian man actually came to Jamaica to pick up the fight, Brian Williamson. Brian was subsequently killed in his home. He was stabbed 74 times. Um, by people who said we need to purge the island of gays. So those became the realities. You either stayed and suffered a harrowing death, or you fled and left your family and your assets and everything. That's what happened starting in the late 70s, early 80s. Now, in 2011, jumping forward several decades, we did a survey and we found that the level of homophobia in Jamaica was at 82%. And we got to work. And we thought, well, you know, if we just did more visibility campaigns, if we started doing more work around um, tolerance, etc., we'd see some reduction. In 2015, we redid the survey, and it's now at 91%. And we were shocked. But it began to make sense. Because after the AIDS epidemic became less of an issue, because now there are anti-retroviral drugs, people are living longer, it's now about marriage. Because we realized that was right after your marriage equality fight. And so again, the new frontier is, well, we, ca we have to prevent the gays from getting marriage and destroying marriage, etc., etc. So the evangelicals have come with a new message. The message is 
end um, gay rights because it will lead to marriage equality. Mm -hmm. right? So we move from AIDS being the scare to marriage equality being the scare. Now, the sad correlation is that with this high level of homophobia, we also have a high HIV prevalence rate. Jamaica has the highest HIV prevalence rate among men who have sex with men in the Western Hemisphere, if not the world, 33%. Because we're driven underground, away from effective prevention, treatment, care, and support interventions. And we're closest to, as an English-speaking island, we're closest to the United States. So we get a lot of the Southern evangelicals literally washing up on our shores with their hateful message. And so we have sadly um, turned our rather innocuous law into a weapon to persecute LGBT people and to drive the HIV epidemic. Um, now, the surveys I spoke about dug into, well, why is this homophobia rising? And all of these, the, the, the persons who were who identified as extremely homophobic um, said that religion, their faith, was what caused it. It wasn't about nationalism. In, in some countries, that's what it is. It's about the national, no, no, no. It was about the faith. This is what they were taught. And we have now domesticated that hate that we were taught. So we are now producing our own evangelicals that are as reactionary as those that came before. Because it fills coffers. It is a very attractive message. People come to hear it. And since every Jamaican grew up in church, it is not an option. You have to go to church. All the persons who sat in the pews heard this message Monday to Friday. Um, or Saturday, sorry, Saturday and Sunday they heard this message. And then our musicians who grew up in church started producing music that reflected what they'd heard. So Jamaica now has the record of the highest per capita anti-gay songs in the world, over 200 plus. And they call for the burning of lesbians, the rape of um, you know, lesbians, corrective. They call for the most vile treatment of LGBT people. So we're not a quiet society. There's music on buses, in taxis, and you know, everywhere. And you hear this anti-gay music Monday to Friday. And then on Saturday and Sunday, you go to church and hear the rhetoric repeated. So we've literally marinated the society, if you will, in hate. Right? So that is why we're where we are. It's a combination of the popular images that we see on TV, the preaching that we hear, the music. But our politicians have joined in because the reality is you do not get elected in Jamaica without being you know, heavily invested in some religious cause or so with some religious group. And so our politicians have started campaigning on the morality platform. And our recent elections prove that. So in 2011, our then prime minister had said she doesn't support the anti-sodomy law. She thinks it should be repealed. She was immediately you know, um, attacked by the fundamentalists. And what she ended up doing is backtracking and saying, well, she will not repeal the law again because it does not concern the majority of Jamaicans who are poor. The new prime minister is a Seventh-day Adventist, and he's a real staunch Seventh-day Adventist. And he has attended anti-gay rallies, you know, um, the family, you know, protect the family rallies that have been mounted in the um, island recently. And he campaigned on a morality platform, restoring the natural family, etc. And he won in February of last year. So we are now in a situation where we are basically surrounded by anti-gay religion, anti-gay music, anti-gay you know, cultural expressions, and anti-gay political views. And the law, which is from 1864, <laughs> It's a British imposed law, has been used to give license or credence to this 
by saying that, well, it was good for our forefathers, so it's good for us. And although some of us have campaigned and saying, look, that was a British imposed law, we're an independent country, we should be able to... No. Mm -mm. The, the rhetoric we hear is, well, the law against rape was also imposed, but we think it's a good law. So it's now our law, just like the law against same gender intimacy. So that's what we are, that's what we're facing. And when we revised our Charter of Rights in 2012, we made this law entrenched in our Constitution. Literally, we saved it from judicial review. So you cannot go to court and challenge the law as being violating any of the rights in the Constitution until Parliament changes it. Only Parliament can change it. And what we're arguing is by adding on this requirement to be registered as a sex offender, you have changed the law. So we're going to see if that flies. And our new charter in 2011 also has, for the first time, a constitutional ban on any form of same-gender relationship re recognition. Not just marriage, any form, common law, any, no civil, nothing. You cannot be recognized in a same-gender relationship, constitutionally. And this is ironic, because remember I said 85% of Jamaicans are born out of wedlock. Marriage was never an issue for most Jamaicans, period. <laughs> Including LGBT people. It wasn't, we weren't campaigning for that because it's not what many of us knew. The majority who, you know, the minority who grew up in, you know, nuclear families, whatever that means, um, it wasn't something that we aspired to. We were fine. We weren't campaigning for it. What happened was a Canadian evangelical from Trinita, Trinity Western University named Dr. Janet F. Buckingham, she came to Jamaica when we were reviewing our law. And Trinity Western is a religious university. And she basically went to parliament and told our parliamentarians, do not adopt the Canadian model charter, which we were planning to do. Because it would have led to, she says, the horrors of marriage equality, as is happening in Canada. Because you know, kids are being abused and all of these this debunked things. She, she used those arguments. And for that reason, that ban was put in our charter. Again, remember, it wasn't something we were campaigning for. We've never had it before. You know, the definition of marriage was never an, wasn't up for debate. Nobody thought about it. And now that kind of ban is now being introduced across the Caribbean. Not because people are campaigning for marriage, but because you're being told by other Western evangelicals that if we don't put it in, it will happen. Okay? So that's, that's what happens. Now, the, 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 the absence of protection in law is one thing, but the results of the homophobia are even more tangible. We have seen some of the most gruesome acts of um, homophobia in Jamaica over the past five years, including um, a lesbian who was correctively raped by four men, and when they were finished, they used a knife to cut her vagina, and they said the reason she was a lesbian was because she was too tight. She did not report it to the police because she would have been re-victimized. Okay? She didn't even go and seek medical attention. The one that gets closest to me was a 13-year-old um, trans youth named Dwayne Jones, identified as she. Dwayne had been kicked out at 13 because she identified as female and her father couldn't deal with it. And so she went to live with some other homeless LGBT youth. And when Duane turned 16, Duane went to a street party in Jamaica dressed as she identified. And she was dancing with a, a, a male friend, someone who knew she was trans. And a female member of Duane's church outed Duane to the mob. And when they were finished, they turned on Duane, they stabbed, shot, ran over Duane with a car, and then threw her, bodies in the, her body in the bush and went back to dance. And that was in 2013, and there's been no arrest. Because when the police went to investigate, nobody saw anything. Because that was, to, that was a trans person. And last year, um, two gentlemen gay were 
in their home and some men came up and just sprayed it with bullets and killed them and when the police went again and asked you know is anybody say no because they were just two what we use the term in jamaica is fish they were two fish so you know they weren't they weren't necessary a heartrending tale for me too is what's happening with homeless lgbt youth because in jamaica pastors tell their parents that having a LGBT youth in your home will bring the wrath of God on the household. My mother is very ill. She has Parkinson's diabetes, an enlarged heart hypertension, and a liver that's failing. And I went to visit her recently, and her pastor told her that the reason she's not being healed is because she won't disown me. It was February of this year. Okay? So parents are telling their um, pastors are telling parents that their kids, as young as 10, need to be kicked out of the home because they are LGBT, and they're, that's why your house is not prospering. You're, you're thinking about a poor economy, right? So you're looking for every opportunity to change your situation. And these kids are now living in sewers. They're selling sex to survive, and the majority of their clients are married men who have to have a um, a woman as a beard. So they're either married or have a female partner. So the woman is a mask or cure for their homosexuality. And these kids are being paid extra for condomless sex by these men. And the last time we tested them, 91% were HIV positive. So there's a bridging of HIV into the populations. And when we, when we speak these truths to the evangelicals, it's like water yeah. off a duck's back. Doesn't matter. Right? And I keep saying, one of these days, they're going to be caught because it's going to happen to one of them. And then it'll be too late. Now, adding to this is the fact that the news media in Jamaica, especially one newspaper owned by the guys who own Sandals Resorts, the, the Jamaica Observer has published some really horrific cartoons. It's like, you know, blackface, if you will, back in the day. It's just horrific. They characterize us as freaks. And when we spoke to the newspaper about it, they said, you know, why are you doing this? They basically said, well, racism is now considered bad, but homophobia not yet. So they're allowed to portray these images. Um, we've also had the head of the Jamaica Teachers Association say that when LGBT kids come for counseling, they will not get any help. No guidance counselor will help our LGBT youth. They will just be reported to the proper authorities. Now, please remember, the majority of schools in Jamaica are either government, I'm sorry, church supported or church owned. Because in a poor society, the church fills the void. They provide a lot of the social services. So as a result, most guidance counselors are religious, very religious. And so they won't provide any counseling. They won't even learn. We have tried to do some work. It's not all black. <laughs> We've tried to do some work, and one of the things we've tried to do is engage with progressive religious voices. We've tried to amplify their voices. And so one of the most successful persons we've worked with is Father Sean Major Campbell. He's an Anglican priest in downtown Kingston who washed the feet of lesbians at his church on World Human Rights Day in 2014. You can imagine how that went down. <laughs> <laughs> but instead of backing off when he was attacked, he has become even more strident. And so one of the things that Father Sean and I are working on for this year in October is um, a symposium, which is here, on intimate conviction. In fact, put my glasses on. A symposium examining the church and anti-sodomy laws across the Commonwealth. And we have some great speakers, including the former head of the United Theological College of the West Indies, um, the first woman to hold such a post. And we're bringing some speakers from the UK. We're trying to make it as, as Commonwealth as possible. So we're having persons from Canada, Michael Coran, who is possibly the most homophobic person in Canada at one point. He's going to be speaking. He's made a total 180. If you have not read his book yet, Epiphany, please read it. It's amazing. A Damascus Road experience, my Canadian um, compatriot here can tell you. <laughs> um, so he's going to be speaking as well. He's not listed here yet. We're also going to have the Bishop of Buckingham, uh, Anglican Bishop of Buckingham, who has made a lot of transition. So what we're trying to do is get religious leaders
to speak to other religious leaders. Because we know that we have tried every other tactic. We've talked about the epidemiology, we've talked about the human rights. It has gone nowhere. So unless religious leaders are able to share with other religious leaders why hating gays is wrong, we'll get nowhere. So that's what we're doing October 12th with Father Sean. We've also done police LGBT sensitivity training. Um, Tom was, before he became, again, <laughs> an, a cleric. He was a Roman Catholic priest first. When he came out, um, he joined MCC, and then he went to the police force, and he was an LGBT liaison officer there, and he developed this program to train police on how to respect the rights of LGBT people. And now he's an Anglican priest. Um, and we adapted his LGBT sensitivity program and taken it to the Caribbean. Because we know that in order for people to not hate gays as much, they have to know us. Visibility is liberty. People fear what they don't know. As, as Bray told me today, the opposite of love is fear. It's not hatred. It's fear. So we have to get them to know us. But for them to know us, we have to be visible. For us to be visible, there has to be security. Right? So we need the police to know that we are there. We're doing capacity building with um, the LGBT groups to advocate in us. You know, it's, it's not hard to understand why LGBT groups are so invisible in the Caribbean. You're talking about microstates. If you will, think of the smallest town in the United States, then surrounded by a moat and fill it with sharks. <laughs> okay? It's hard for ideas to get out and come in. You have what you have. You know, in a small town, the cultural agent, the social change, who, who you have is who you have. You don't have something coming from another jurisdiction that, you know, all of a sudden is, is given the same weight. No, 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 you have what you have. And so it's hard to change things that way. So we are trying to work in those communities to build their capacity to say, look, this is how you can advocate effectively. Right? We've also done visibility campaigns like pop-up stands, protests, so that other LGBT people know that they're not alone. And one of the successful things we've done is Montego Bay Pride. Now, as I was, as I was explaining to Bray, no, let me contextualize Montego Bay Pride for you. You're talking in a criminalized context. So to do Pride in Montego Bay, what you do is you register online, and the night before the Pride, we tell you where to meet at a remote location. Mm -hmm. And then we, a van goes and picks you up there, and check, we check you out again, and then we transport you to the venue. And then after we do most of the events, which are listed here, we also do pop-up protests. So we drive into town, my dad driving the rainbow van. He, was an, he is an evangelical, he's a Pentecostal, and he's made a 180, but that's another story. <laughs> and we you know, drive into town, and we jump out for five minutes with flags, and jump in and go off and look at that. So we do a mobile pride. <laughs> okay, you do what you gotta do, okay? Um, and it's been very effective because, again, it's not about changing the minds of society. That's a long, long way, but letting people know that they're not alone is very important to building community. Um, one of the things I've had to do is campaign with my colleagues in law, many of whom now are leading the country. The Prime Minister and I went to school together. We were at the same university. We were on hall together. The Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Attorney General, all of them, we're on the same age group. It's a small country, a small town. <laughs> we know each other. So I'm now working with them, reaching out to colleagues, because, of course, they knew me from university. They know me from, you know, all these places. And yet, they are still unwilling to view me as, or view gays as humans, even though they know me. Right? So we have to be open to our friends who are on the other side. We have to learn to live reconciliation, which is something I've told Bray. I have to work, work on the, the former, no, my son's godfather, who is an evangelical, most homophobic man on, in Jamaica, who has disowned his son because his son, not gay, but supports gays. Okay? That's the kind of work we have to do. We're trying to set up a shelter for the homeless LGBT. We're trying to do many things. We've had some success. New tip. We had the former um, um, mayor of Kingston speak at one of the Pride events as the keynote speaker. And that was a big risk for her. She subsequently lost the election, but she has not backed down. She's been supportive of gays. 
We've launched cases challenging the anti-sodomy laws in Jamaica and um, the practice of homophobia. And the briefs are here, <laughs> one of which we challenge the law of Belize and Trinidad because, as I said, they banned the entry of homosexuals. We've challenged TV stations that have refused to air an ad calling for respect for the rights of gays. Because here in the United States, one of the things that helped to move the needle was the presence of images, pro positive images of gays, Will and Grace, The New Normal, etc. We don't have that in Jamaica. When Sam Smith in the Grammys mentioned, just mentioned, that he had a gay partner or thanked his gay partner for leaving him so that he could write this wonderful song, <laughs> that was um, censored. That mention was censored in Jamaica. Okay? So even those images are hard to get on air. So we are fighting to get just a 30 second ad <laughs> on air that will talk about respecting the rights of gays. We've also challenged the anti-sodomy law in Jamaica, and I'm the claimant, and I've taken over as the claimant in this case because the person who was the claimant had to back out because he was facing death threats to him and his family. And I, I was his lawyer, so I took over and became the claimant, and I found another lawyer, because a lawyer who has himself, or has himself a client or something like that is a bad idea, anyway. <laughs> so I have another lawyer, but the irony is the court allowed 10 religious groups into the case to join the government in defending the law because these religious groups said that they needed to protect the anti-sodomy law, to protect their right to religion, religious freedom. Because if you decriminalize sodomy, then they will not be able to condemn gays anymore. And that's important to them. Okay? So what I do in the privacy of my bedroom, holding hands with my husband, they must keep that criminal so that they can continue to say from the pulpit, homosexuality is wrong. That's what it boils down to. And then the government disallowed, the, sorry, the court disallowed the public defender who wanted to be in the case to support me. Because she just wanted to bring the human rights perspective. And they said, nope, she's, if she was seen to be supporting, this is what the court said, if she was seen to be supporting a gay cause, then no other person with a, you know, a social a human rights issue would go to the public defender. No other Jamaican with a human rights issue would go to the public defender because the office would be tainted. Having support. This is what I'm up against, people. <laughs> so right now it's 10 against 1. If the public defender, well, 11 at the government, the, if the public defender is allowed in, it will even it a little bit, it'll be 11 against 2. <laughs> and the lawyer for the religious groups is the former Attorney General of Jamaica. The Solicitor General, who will be arguing for the government, belonged as chair, as was a board member of one of these religious groups. The current Attorney General, is a member of one of these religious groups, and they all taught the judge. Okay? It's not going to be an easy fight, but thankfully we have the option of going above them to Court of Appeal and to the Privy Council. So that's what we're hoping on. Um, we have also seen some progressive editorials in Jamaica because of our advocacy. The major newspapers come out in support of LGBT rights multiple times. We have also seen um, a few Jamaican musicians come out as gay and lesbian, including Diana King, who lives in the United States, she's a lesbian, lives in the United States, but very connected to Jamaica. Who we're trying to get <laughs> is um, Usain Bolt to say something, he's not gay, let's clarify that, he's not gay. <laughs> but for him to say something supportive, because you know, words by someone of his ill could help. But he's been very neutral, he's a strong Catholic, so it's very neutral. You know, I have gay friends, I'm cool with the gays, but I'm not going to get into the politics. That's basically what he said, which is disappointing. Um, we had, under the previous US administration, a lot of support. Um, and, you know, one of the things they did for us was give us access to politicians, because the politicians will not meet with us in their offices. They will not, they will not allow us to talk with them because they don't want people to see us coming through their doors because we will taint them. So what the US um, ambassador would do is have fets or parties at his home and invite the Jamaican government. And of course, everybody wants to go to an American uh, embassy event and they'd also be the gays. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't escape us. <laughs> so we got to talk, right? And they realized we're not that scary. And when President Obama visited Jamaica, April 9, in 2015, my birthday, uh, <laughs> he actually did something remarkable. 
He, met, he called us before he went. His people called the LGBT community and said, how should I address the issue? I don't want to make things worse. How do I address this issue? And we say, just, just um, acknowledge that Jamaica is on a journey. When you're talking, just acknowledge. And in a public forum, he identified, just asked one of the lesbians to stand up. And the girl with great trepidation stood up. Now, when the leader of the free world tells you to stand up, you don't say no. So she, <laughs> she stood up, and she was identified publicly by the American president as being a lesbian and doing great work to fight for the rights of the lesbians. And then she sat back down, and she thought she'll never leave this place alive. But because the American president had validated her, all of a sudden, people said, you know, good for you, you know, wonderful. So that kind of work has been very important. We've also seen the Church of God in Jamaica, which is very conservative, make a transition. And I had a quote here, which I'm sorry I couldn't project, where in 2016, April 2016, the um, senior pastor, one of the New Testament Church of God said, we celebrate you, not your lifestyle. That was what was captured in the newspaper. But in April 1 of this year, the youth pastor for the denomination basically said, the church should treat homosexuals with love. Okay? So we're on a journey. Okay? He didn't go as far as we wanted him to go, but we're on a journey. Um, but sadly, in response to all of this progressive work, we're seeing more evangelicals from the United States wash up on our shores with the same kind of anti-gay rhetoric. And they are very well funded. And so for the first time, we have seen massive anti-gay conferences, massive anti-gay marches. You know, in the last two years, we've had three. And they have pulled like 25,000 people, which is in a small island, that's huge people. Um, you block the whole square. These have really shook up the society because we were a live and let live. You know, yes, people didn't like the gay thing, but it was not talked about. Now it's become a very big political issue. And what the prime minister said in response to this is decriminalization of sodomy must be put to a public vote. He will not go through parliament, must have a referendum on whether I can hold my husband's hand in the privacy of my bedroom. That must be decided on by the public. Okay? That's how ridiculous we've become. Now, I'm going to end by helping you to help me. I like to say that for those in the global north who are interested in helping, there are three things you can do. Acknowledge respect, and engage, A-R-E. Acknowledge that a lot of the homophobia we wrestle with in the global south came from the global north. This is the laws, the culture, the religion, okay? It's not endemic, we were taught it. And please also acknowledge that you are wrestling with these issues too, okay? I don't have to ask you to go far or cast your mind too far in the United States to see of elements or examples of homophobia right here in your own country. So this acknowledgement will hopefully help you to keep humble. <laughs> because the last thing we need is neocolonialism. We don't need you coming in to save us. We need support, but we don't need salvation. Okay? And it's odd to say that in a space like this, but <laughs> support, not salvation. Then respect. Respect our local leaders. Now, they may be bastards, but they are our <laughs> bastards. I will say nothing of yours. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> but it is our democratic process that put them there, so we last have to work with them. So be careful how you engage with them. And I say this because at one point, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Canada decided to take on the Speaker of the House of Uganda about the homophobia there. And the Speaker of the House of Uganda, as a Catholic, was kind of on the fence about the anti-sodomy law. Didn't really care, didn't, you know. But because she was taken on in public in this way, she was insulted and said, she, she told the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Canada, um, Uganda is not a vassal state of Canada. So she went back in great triumph to Uganda and pushed through the anti-homosexuality bill, which would have imposed the, the death penalty, just because of how she was treated. So have conversations, but please be respectful, because they're our leaders. And also respect that there are people on the ground doing work. As I said, don't think you have to save us, you know. We are doing the work, we just need some support. Share ideas, right? And then engage. Engage by setting the positives. 
So that's why I don't recommend a boycott. I don't support a boycott of Jamaica. I don't support a boycott of any country that has anti-gay laws. I support engagement. So if you're going to Jamaica, which I hope you do, it's beautiful, stay at what we call truly inclusive resorts. They, they do exist. Resorts that have done a lot of training in, with their staff about how to support LGBT people and also how to cater to LGBT guests. They do exist. They just can't advertise, but they exist. And we want to reward those, right? And when you're there, when you're traveling in Jamaica, you know, you can have conversations with your bus driver, your, you know, chamber maid, whatever. You can have conversations and say, look, you know, in our country, um, we have decriminalized and, well, it hasn't really gone that badly. You know, we haven't <laughs> blown up. <laughs> but what you have happening in our country is that people who are gay get to be with gay people and people who are not aren't. It's not like we're forcing straight people to marry gay people. No, it doesn't happen. You know, and one of the things that gets Jamaicans when I tell them this is, you know, in Canada, a woman doesn't have to worry if her husband is secretly gay. Because if he is gay, he can just go find somebody else who is gay. But in Jamaica, because of the homophobia, your husband could very well be a closet case because he can't be himself. And what's that doing to you? Right? What is that doing to you? What's that doing to the children? And I tell my own story. I was married to a woman because the church told me I had to be, to be cured. Someone who knew I was gay for 10 years, she knew she was my best friend, she was my grace to my will. <laughs> but we, we believed the church that I could be cured. And the, end, the result was, after four years, I, told, I can't pretend anymore. I'm mentally cheating on you every time we have sex. Pardon me for being so brutal. I said, I, you need to find somebody who can appreciate you for who you are. And as my best friend, I had to do that to her. And it hurt for a while, but now we're good friends again. And we have a son who is awesome. But I engage and say, look, this is what happens when we don't allow people to be themselves. So engage. Sell the positives of inclusion. Please, sell how it has helped. Don't do the finger wagging. It alienates. And sometimes you have to engage with cash. OK? Sadly, we are outnumbered, outgunned, and outfunded in the Caribbean, in the global south, because the churches that are working against us have a captive audience every weekend that they collect offerings from. <laughs> and they are able to fund massive anti-gay campaigns. We are starving. We're struggling. Right? And we're doing good work. But if you can, find a way to support financially. Because, trust me, this is a matter of life and death. Thank you. Sure. Is that good for everybody? Sure. And then uh, Stephanie will wish you all a happy journey home and thank you. So, any questions? Um, I came tonight because it was kind of interesting because um, I want to get an understanding of the LGBT um, Jamaica um, perspective because. Um, I have a friend, and, um, and I do Bible study with her, and um, she's Jamaican. And I know one time we had Bible study, she had mentioned to me and to others that um, she had a cousin living in Jamaica, and um, the words that went around, he was gay, and he had to hurry up and marry someone yep. because he was being, you know, ostracized by his family, his friends. But she didn't go any further, but now this really bring me understanding to why. Yeah. It's a matter of life and death. And I didn't, I never, you know, she didn't go no further because I guess, you know, she didn't want to, well, probably have time to discuss that, but it's really, I, I didn't know that the gay community yeah. over in that country. Well, it's this, like it's so this is the thing, the Jamaica Tourist Board does a very good job. <laughs> and we don't do a good enough job of selling the other side. Because we love our country. 
Every Jamaican is patriotic. I mean, we wave flags when you say both wins and we win the But we're very patriotic and we don't like to reveal this. But the sad reality is until people know, change won't happen. So, as I like to say, we eradicate hate when we educate. So hopefully you'll use this knowledge now. Yes, yeah, so thank you. Thank you too. Thank you for coming. Yes. What about social media and the world is flat and you get information across borders and things like that? Is there any the positive things for the United States get there? Is oh yes. No. The, the challenge is that we don't have a deep enough internet penetration. We're still a economic, a resource poor country, so internet penetration is not as deep. Okay? And what you also find is that the persons who we need to get to, as social media, it can, it can literally put you in a bubble. You only see what you want to see. It's not like the regular media where you know, you're watching the news, you'll see good and bad ads. No, no, no. Social media, you can surround yourself with the only, only news feeds that you want. So the conservatives are only surrounded by news feeds that they want to see. So to get to them, we cannot rely on social media. We are seeing it. You know, we tap into the progressive stuff, but we're not the ones that need to be um, informed. And that's the challenge with social media. Even if we had it, I don't think it would be as effective as getting into the regular media. It was things like Will and Grace and New Normal and seeing Ellen come out and all of that. That's what changed the dynamic, which is why we're fighting this case in court to have this ad on TV. Sure. Grace, uh, one, one big question. I noticed uh, looking through the folder, during your Pride events, do you in fact get uh, any type of uh, feedback or any type of publicity from, say, the TV stations or the radio stations or anything else like that? Or is it just strictly uh, a LGBTQI uh, type of event that's right. in a little corner? So we do two things. One of the things we do is um, we do come into building in, you know, it's just to make people know that they're not alone. And two, we also do some public events, like the pop-up stands. But something I forgot to mention is we also deliberately do a film festival, which we don't advertise as gay. We tell people, free film and food. <laughs> 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 and they come, and when they're watching the film, it builds so they realize, oh, this is a gay thing. And at the end of the film, we just open the floor for conversations. And the point, we say, no booing, no clapping. People can respond to how the film affected them. And that is when people who were probably very homophobic are able to ventilate. But they've just seen a film about normalizing gays. And then they're saying these negative things. And they're saying, but it doesn't make sense. So that's what we do. In terms of publicity, we, we control that because people have to go back to their lives. So we did have one instance where we did a march. And that was in 2009, that's why we don't do it again. We did the march and the media came. And when a couple of guys went back home, even though they were wearing masks, they, their shirts were identified, four of them had to then flee their communities. One was held up by, with a gun by his brother, <laughs> told he had to leave. So we don't tell the media, we take images and we put what images we want up uh, after we check with people to make sure that they're fine. But we do not let the media know. Not to mention the fact that when I had that march in 2009, the police lost my permit request four times. Mm -hmm. And I had to go do a solo sit-in. <laughs> and when the officer realized I wasn't going, he then sent one man on a bike to ride at the front of my 200-person parade. In, in other words, if anything went down, he was not going to be there. <laughs> <He's gone. laughs> so we control it. We have to. Someone there? Yeah. No? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, given your um, public presence, are you able to travel safely in Jamaica? Yeah. <laughs> I was saying to Bray. Um, so I do go back to Jamaica. I try to go back at least once a month. My mom is unwell, as I described. Um, and so for work and otherwise. But I have a security protocol that I don't talk about. Okay. Because um, it's not the time. But I have had instances. I mean, one time we were at a stoplight. 
in Jamaica and someone recognized me and tried to call a crowd to attack the car and the light changed and I was able to get through. So I have, I'm really like a prisoner when I go home. I can't be visible. But I've also had instances here. When we were in Toronto, on the first day I went back to Jamaica for a case, challenging the Antarctica, there was a bomb at our front steps. We just, the police had to come and detonate. Uh, for a pressure cooker with shrapnel. And we found out it's because a Jamaican lawyer in the case that I was up against put into the court records my address in Canada. Because the lawyer said, I don't need protection from the Jamaican state because I'm now living in Canada. And that information became public, and that's how that became. So I, there, is, there are security issues. Um, but, you know, I like to think of myself as being naive, because if I wasn't, I couldn't do this job. You can't think of the cost, you just have to do it. I don't think MLK Jr. thought of the end. He thought of the process. That's what I'm doing. Uh, one other question. You're a licensed lawyer in both countries. No, I did not choose to become Paul in Canada. I think Canada has enough lawyers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I only want to practice in Jamaica, and as I was sharing with Maria earlier, I think actually I want to leave practicing I want to go into reconciliation, um, because I have to understand why there is this fear by people who I grew up with in the church. Why do they fear me so much? I won't use the word hate. Why do they fear me so much now? So that's where I want to transition into. I don't think I'll be doing and so you, you only, only practice in only, Jamaica? Correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's, that, that, that's one of the basic reasons why you go to Jamaica right. as often as you do. Right. Yes. Any other questions? I have one. Sure. Is your son safe? <laughs> <laughs> so, my son now lives with his mother in the Cayman Islands. So he's... I didn't realize he was in Cayman. Yes. Um, he had an interesting time. He's being raised Catholic. And when he was young, his Catholic prep school gave him a hard time because he's left-handed. And they were trying to force him That's to write with his right hand. It's an abomination. And I had to go and speak strongly to the school. And so when he became, and so for two years, his mother left him with me because she couldn't deal with the thing, the outing. She left him with me. And um, when he turned, 12, he was really wrestling with my orientation. And I called him one day and I said, you know, remember when you went to school and you're having an issue with your left hand, you remember? I said, you know that in the faith you're not practicing, that was considered an abomination. And people like you were thrown to the pyre because you were wrong. Um, you remember that? And he said, yes. And I said, that's with me. You know, if I wanted to, I, if I could, I would have changed because I would have fit in. You would have written you the right hand if you could have. You'd have fit in. But you can't. Is it in your brain? Is it what? It's just, it is just it. And that's when he began to understand. And uh, a year later, he wrote me a Father's Day note saying, Happy Father's Day to you and to Tom, who he calls dad number two. <laughs> so it's possible. <laughs> you know, the transition is possible. <laughs>